Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. Tonight, we're going to definitely be focusing on the southern tip of Africa, more specifically, uh, how the things that are going on here, but more to looking towards the future and how things could be done uh, to solve many of the problems that are uh, still plaguing us here today. So to join me for this conversation on federalism is uh, Richard Wilkinson. Uh, he is an attorney with a special interest in provincial powers in South Africa. And he's also, uh, some of you might recognize him from a quite semi-viral Twitter thread that he did a while back when uh, Adams Roots was in the, the United States. And uh, I wanted to talk about that tonight, but I thought, well, Richard actually has this uh, big wealth of knowledge when it comes to federal powers and provincial powers. So I think we're going to start by uh, delving into those. And if there's some time left by the end of the episode, we can talk a little bit about that, uh, that thread. But uh, welcome on the show, Richard, and I'm looking forward to it. Hey, thanks so much, man. This is uh, awesome to be here. Relieved that it's in English. Because uh, Afrikaans is needy, needy, needy savers to me, but uh, uh, life on your listeners are probably Afrikaans, but <laughs> I'm not going to be able to roll in Afrikaans as well as you can roll in English. So, mm. you know, I always feel slightly embarrassed and self conscious at how good uh, Afrikaans people's English is and how bad my Afrikaans is. So, anyway, mm. to, uh, good no, to, yeah, good to have you here. And how many people do we have? Uh, at the moment, uh, there's uh, 15 people uh, tuning in live, but that's going to tick up as the conversation yeah. progresses uh, and as people uh, see that we're live. So yeah. maybe just to uh, to set the stage and to lay the foundation for the conversation, federalism is a pretty pretty big word when it comes to just the layman's understanding of politics and how it works. Um, you seem to have a very keen interest in it. So maybe as someone that understands it, I mean, you don't really understand the concept unless you can uh, explain it simply. How would you explain that that concept to a to a layman, but someone that is interested in uh, the way forward for South Africa and maybe some alternate uh, solutions? Yeah, sure. So um, I I was at UC Law School from about two thousand nine to twenty eleven, and we had to do a mini thesis. And uh, at that point in time, um, the DA had just won the Western Cape government. Uh, in the 2009 election. So I, I got quite interested in what provincial governments can do. And so I started off by just reading the constitution and then, and then I did a mini dissertation on this. And then when I was at Cambridge, I did a full out thesis on provincial legislative powers. Before I went there, I spent six months working in the Western Cape government where I did some research, try to come up with some proposals for what a province can do from a legislative um, perspective. Uh, basically, we've got three uh, tiers of government in South Africa. We've got the national government, the provincial government, and the local government. Um, and each tier has got different powers and different um, uh, different uh, different things that they can and can't do. But there's only really one province that, for a sustained period of time, has been run by an opposition party, and that's the, the Western Cape. Uh, certainly since 2009, I think we've had a coherent opposition, well, a coherent provincial government run by Helen Zilla and then Alan Mundy. Um, and that's really been the the one and only example of a province that, uh, I mean, KZN was run by the IFP on and off for, for a period. Uh, but the Western Cape is, is probably the best example of a, of a province that's run by a different party because the other eight provinces are all run by ANC, single party uh, majority governments, right? So there's not much chance of, of an ANC province ever trying to do something that's dramatically different to the national government. Uh, there's been a bit of a scrap over ETOLs and a bit of a scrap over one or two things, and they've done try to pass some bizarre KZN slums act and KwaZulu Natal. But really, the question is, what can the Western Cape do? And if the DA ever won Gauteng, it would be, what can the West, can, what can Gauteng do? Uh, what what is different? What what can you do that's different from from national government? So hopefully tonight I can just chat you through the basics of how it works and and what where the potential is for for stuff to happen here. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, as you explained, there South Africa has uh, these provinces with all these uh, with different uh, legislation, legislative powers, and different types of things they can do. But South Africa is not a, a federal republic, or South Africa is not a federal system. Uh, hmm. What is South Africa? What 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 do you call that? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mess. I mean, you you got systems that are strong federal systems like the United States, and then you got systems uh, like Canada, Germany, Australia, which are stronger than us. I, I think. Uh, 
the provinces had more power and it was somewhere in between but I, I think people underestimate how much power the provinces actually do have and I don't always feel that the Western Cape is maximizing their powers in that area uh look it takes a lot of work and and it's not it's easier said than done but if you look at what the what, what the constitution actually gives the provinces uh it's it's quite a lot um and there's there's huge scope for for pro, for, for provincial government to be quite active when it comes to legislative matters i think it's important to distinguish between legislative matters and budgetary matters fiscal powers the provinces don't have tax powers so they can't raise or lower taxes so you can't you know change the vat rate in the western cape or something like that which i think is is the real big power is taxation uh, basically your provincial budget is allocated to you by the national government according to the division of revenue act and so you just get an amount of money that's largely based upon your population numbers but also based upon whether you are a wealthy or poor province and it's structured in such a way that it's tilted slightly towards the poor provinces so you just get your money and um, and then you're basically in charge of 33 or 34 concurrent functions of government uh, and some other things. And so you can choose how to spend the money however you want. If you want to spend more on education or more on health, uh, I guess you can. But you can only spend more money by taking away from a different function. So it's not that interesting. Um, the real question is... So, so therefore, it, the real powers of the provinces lie in what they can do from a legislative perspective. This is where the provincial parliament passes laws that will conflict with national law and prevail over national law. And that's my area of research. And that's what the fourth schedule of the constitution is all about. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I heard in a previous interview that I listened that you did specifically on federalism, you mentioned uh, the three-tiered system that South Africa has. Could you maybe unpack that in, in simple terms? Yeah, so um, uh, national government has got legislative authority in almost every area, uh, and the national parliament really can pass laws on anything. Then you've got the fourth schedule and the fifth schedule. Uh, the fifth schedule of the constitution uh, provides certain exclusive competences to the provinces. These are things that the national government cannot legislate on because only the provinces can legislate on. And they're a bit of a joke, okay? And we can go through those uh, if you are interested. Uh, the fourth, I'm just going to bring up the, the fifth schedule now. Um, okay, and then you've got the fourth schedule, and the fourth schedule provides for a list of concurrent functions of government. Uh, and these are functions of government that are shared between national and provincial. So let's go through the through the um, the fifth schedule. This is the stuff over which the province has got exclusive competence. It's basically abattoirs, ambulance services, archives other than national archives, libraries other than national libraries, liquor licenses. That's the big one. Provincial cultural matters, museums other than national museums, provincial recreation and amenities, provincial sport, provincial roads and traffic. Okay, so and and vet veterinary services, excluding regulation of the profession. So you know it's it's a bit of a joke what the fifth schedule is. Okay, and other than liquor licenses, I don't really see the provinces doing much in that area. But what is interesting is the fourth schedule. This is the list of concurrent functions of government, and these are quite important. Um, what they basically say um is it, they're 33 or 34 of them uh, and they include things like agriculture um disaster management which is a really important one considering we've just gone through a massive um pandemic so disaster management is, is a concurrent yeah. function of government so you've got the national disaster management act you don't have a western cape disaster management act which i think is, is really disappointing uh education yeah, so, when the, so when the national government says uh, we're locking down and uh, these are all the the regulations that we're putting in re in regards to the the, the the crisis then the provinces just have to go along with it well, so what happens if you're in the fourth schedule is that you can have uh, legislation that conflicts with each other. So you can have national law and provincial law, and they're both conflict with each other. And then the constitutional court will determine which one prevails over the other one. So let's go for something simple like road traffic regulation, which is a concurrent function of government. We've got the National Road Traffic Act, and that sets out the maximum speed limit, and it sets out the maximum blood alcohol level. 120 kilometers an hour and 0 0.05 milligrams per liter, or whatever it is. Um, you could potentially you have a Western Cape Road Traffic Act, which sets the speed limit at 140, or sets the blood alcohol level at zero, or whatever. And if there's inconsistency between the two legal frameworks, then you've got a conflict of law. 
And the Constitution says that that conflict of law must be resolved by the Constitutional Court. And there are effectively 10 overrides that the national government can use. And if they can use any, if they can um, uh, utilize any one of those overrides, then the national law will prevail over the provincial law. But if they are unable to utilize any of those 10 overrides, then the provincial law prevails over the national law. So briefly, just to go through those 10 overrides, the first override is probably the most important one. And it says that national legislation uh, that applies uniformly across the country will prevail over provincial legislation if the national legislation deals with a matter that cannot be regulated effectively by legislation enacted by the respective provinces individually. So it's a very open-ended um, uh, term. It basically, is this a matter that can be regulated effectively by the provinces individually? So if you think about the speed limit, uh, I would think that probably can be done by the provinces individually because you don't need to have uniform speed limit in, across the country. 100, 120, 140, whatever, as you drive into the province, there's a road sign that says the speed limit's 100 or whatever. But the blood alcohol level is different because if you have a couple of drinks at Sun City and then drive across the border from the northwest into Gauteng, um, you can't just sober up immediately. So if Gauteng has a zero, zero uh, blood alcohol limit, but the northwest is 0 0.1, you're going to have problems when people cross provincial borders. So the blood alcohol level is probably a matter that cannot be regulated effectively by the provinces individually. And so the first override would take effect and the national law would prevail over the provincial law. So when it comes to disaster management, uh, there is no Western Cape Disaster Management Act. But in theory, if there were a Western Cape Disaster Management Act, you could effectively have two, um, two tiers of governments conflicting with each other. The, the president would announce a, a national lockdown, come up with all his rules through in course under Klamini Zuma. Premier of the Western Cape could come up with a provincial lockdown where he says, uh, you must wear a mask, that's it. No other rules, okay? You don't have to stay in your house. You don't have to, no curfew. We've got one rule in this province, you must wear a mask and any other rules won't apply in this province. Okay, so what you've now got is a conflict of law and the constitutional court will have to um, consider the 10 overrides and consider whether the provincial law prevails over national or not. And as I just said, the, the first the first override is, is this a matter that can be regulated effectively by the provinces individually? Um, and, you know, advocates will stand up in the constitutional court and present their arguments about whether lockdowns over a pandemic is a matter that can be regulated at a provincial level. You know, the province might lose. But at least you're in the court. At least you're giving it a go. I mean, some of the other overrides that apply, the second override is very similar to the first override. Um, it says, in order to be dealt with effectively, uh, it's a matter that requires uniformity across the nation. And the national legislation provides that uniformity um, by establishing norms and standards, frameworks, or policies. So again, it's, it's a little bit like... Um, begging the question, I mean, is this a matter that requires uniformity across the nation, which is the same as the first override? Um, and then, so, so those are the two most important overrides. And then there's a long list of other ones that um, that I think are less useful for national because they're pretty extreme and they're not going to come up very often. And if you like, I can quickly run through them. Uh, national legislation will prevail if it's necessary for the maintenance of national security. So if you're changing the speed limit, that's not going to apply. Um, national legislation prevails if it's necessary for the maintenance of economic unity. Again, I don't think that's going to come up very often. Uh, if it's necessary for the protection of the common market in respect of the mobility of goods, services, capital and labor, uh, the promotion of economic activities across provincial boundaries, the promotion of equal opportunity or equal access to government services, that's quite an interesting one because if you start trying to innovate in any area, you might have that override used against you because any kind of difference might be perceived as being generating you know, inequality. And then the final one is um, if it's uh, necessary for the protection of the environment, then national will prevail. Uh, sorry, there are another two here as well. Um, national prevails if um, provincial legislation is, aim is unreasonable and uh, effectively prejudices the economic health or security interests of another province or the country as a whole or if it impedes the implementation of national economic policy. So th those are the 10 overrides, and the national government can reach for any one of them. They just need one, and if they can find any one of those, then national will prevail. But they're quite open-ended, and they give a lot of discretion to the Constitutional Court. Mm. Before we continue, I would just like to say thanks to uh, Hutscorp Software, who gave uh, 35 rands here as a super chat. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, and then there's an interesting question here, or statement and question from Robert Daigan in the chat, or Marubane, who says, 
policymakers complain that provinces don't have control over their budget. The Financial Management Act allows leftovers uh, to be treated as own revenue. Can this uh, return control? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, got, the provinces have no control over taxation policy and, and the Division of Revenue Act is really uh, a national law and, and uh, they hand out money on, based, on, uh, demog based on population share you know, so there you are. They, 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 the provinces can raise money through motor vehicle licenses and through the liquor licenses and through user charges at various facilities, like if a museum charges like a money at the gate or something. Um, I don't know how else a province would raise money. I mean, uh, uh, there's some things that, some way out ideas that I've had, but I don't think many of them would work. I mean, if the Western Cape had put a, a million rand into Bitcoin in 2009, they'd be sitting on the world's largest sovereign wealth fund right now. But that's not going to happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they are dependent on national government for their for their money. And unless you want to complain about the Division of Revenue Act and say that it's unconstitutional, um, that's, that's the money that you get and you have to work within that framework. Hmm. And you mentioned now that uh, provinces do have a fair bit of control over the internal affairs, but uh, your examples were now, uh, for example, the speed limit or the blood alcohol yeah. level. But how much in, can can you explain how much influence do provinces really have over the internal affairs in in matters maybe that go past just the the speed limit or the the blood blood alcohol level, for example, over their police force uh, yeah. or over their uh, their borders. The two big ones, uh, so if you look at Schedule 4, the uh, concurrent functions of government, the two big ones there are healthcare services and education. Uh, education excluding the universities. So you don't have control over the universities, but you do have control over the rest of education and healthcare services. And in terms of your budget, it makes up about 70% of your budget. So what sort of control do you have? Well, the DA takes a fairly corporatist approach to governance. They try and get things to work. So if you work into, walk into a Western Cape hospital, you'd expect the equipment to work, the staff to be there, you know, to be clean and safe and to provide a high quality level of care. How do they do that? They don't do it through legislation. Um, the DA has passed very few pieces of legislation in the last 13 years, um, 12 years. They, they, they don't have an expansive legislative uh, sort of agenda what what those guys do is they work hard every day to make sure the right people in the right jobs budgets are managed properly and you've got full control over that i mean it, when it comes to running the western cape education system appointing principals I, I, as far as i'm aware the western cape government is pretty much in control of its budget its staff its facilities and so on um yeah, so, so and, and, the, and the Western Cape tries its best to, to do that. There are big functions of government over which they have no control. Number one, the police, okay? Number two, ESCOM. Number three, Transnet and Metro Rail. And that's what this referendum is all about. They're trying to call a provincial referendum, and we can chat about that as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the, what they want is a provincial referendum where the people of the Western Cape will be asked the question, do you want control over these things to be transferred to the province? And uh, if they win that referendum, they can go to Pretoria with a piece of paper saying, well, the people want this, please give it to us, and then ask oh. Pretoria to give it to us. You know, Personally, I think they should have done that 10 years ago, but anyway, better late than never. And, um, uh, but yeah, at the moment, they've got no control over that. When it comes to the police, the only thing they've got is what's called oversight. Uh, and so the police basically have to provide reports to the provincial government. And that's a great pity because in the interim constitution, I think the police were given to the provinces. Uh, and then in the final constitution, it got taken away from, from the provinces. You know, I think policing is huge. But I think the rest of the criminal justice system is also huge. Uh, prosecutions, correctional services, um, I think appointment of judges in the judiciary. If you could have a provincial judicial services commission that appoints judges to the high court, that would be very nice. Uh, we're a million miles away from that at the moment. But I think that the way that the province gets that sort of stuff is just by calling referendums. I, I think starting with police, Transnet and ESCOM is a great idea. Uh, win that referendum with a huge majority, 65 70%. Go to mm. Pretoria, ask for it nicely. If you don't get it, call another referendum where you just take another five or ten things off, um, off the national government. Um, yeah. 
So uh, uh, regarding this uh, referendum that, or these ty this uh, ability that the DA is now trying to instill where the provinces can have referendums, maybe just for those that don't have context, uh, what is it exactly what they're trying to achieve here? Um, so the constitution uh, permits the president to call national referendums on any on any matter he likes and he, i think he can even call referendums limited to a certain geographical area of the country mm. the constitution also says that the premier can call provincial referendums on any matter uh so that's any one of the country's nine premiers but the referendum must be called in accordance with national legislation so we do have a referendums act in 1983 but the referendums act only speaks about the president and the national government because back in 1983 we didn't have a provincial sphere of government so there is no national legislation that empowers the premier to call a referendum but he's entitled to do so in terms of the constitution so there's kind of like an obligation on parliament to to pass this law and parliament very conveniently has not done that in the last 30 years they should have done it in 1996 they didn't and you know someone in the western cape government has looked at the constitution and thought well, I actually, you know what happened? I think Phil Craig and the Cape Independence Advocacy Group put a bit of pressure on them. Anyway, mm. they now say they want to call it a referendum, but they don't have the legislation in place. And so uh, Natasha Mazzoni, I think, is trying to get this through the national parliament, which is going to be difficult considering that the ANC has a massive majority there. So you're probably going to have to go to the constitutional court and get a court order insisting that this law be enacted by the national parliament. Mm. Um, and then, and then the Premier will be able to call his referendum. Hmm. But uh, on that note, though, let's say for argument's sake that they are successful and they can now uh, hold yeah. referendums. And uh, the question of Cape Independence aside, um, let's say on uh, more smaller achievable things like, for example, control over the police or a better control over uh, electricity or uh, energy. How much weight would such a referendum carry uh, if they were to be successful? Let's say they, they win the referendum 60% uh, or 65%. Yeah. How much realistic weight would be behind that type of uh, result? Uh, zero legal weight at all. The national government can ignore it. Um, but if the DA starts winning big majorities in referendums and the national government ignores it, you're just, you're just um, lighting the fuse on Cape Independence. It's a massive moral victory for the for for the Western Cape if they win a referendum on the police. Massive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the last time we dabbled in referendums was in 1992 when F.W. de Klerk was the president, and he was under a lot of pressure from the conservative flank of uh, Afrikaner nationalism. Uh, they were they, they were a conservative party. You know, a lot of people not happy with the dismantling of apartheid and moving towards constitutional democracy. Uh, de Klerk called his referendum, and he got 68 percent. 69 percent and that was it i mean th that was the end of apartheid it was the end of any uh, of any real debate about about things because if you get hammered that badly in a, in a referendum um you know if it was 52 48 well th mm -hmm. then you can fight on a bit a bit like the brexit referendum but if you if you win your referendum 68 32 you've got a huge uh mandate to implement your policy and that's exactly what the clerk did he wrapped up um his government in two years, elections, new constitution, and the ANC uh, won that 1994 election. Um, and I, I think that 1992 referendum is massively overlooked and underestimated in South African history. I think it is huge uh, because it was, you know, incidentally, it's also just white South Africa re publicly renouncing apartheid, which um, nobody has ever forgiven <laughs> F.W. de Klerk for. I think that's why he's hated so much is because... Um, it wasn't the victory that the ANC wants everybody to believe it was. It was more of a capitulation or an agreement, you know, to dismantle apartheid. Anyway, he won his referendum, never looked back. And if Alan Wendy calls a referendum on the police and wins it big, you know, th this referendum would be three separate questions. Police, question one, do you support transferring police from national to provincial government? Yes or no. Question two, same thing, but for ESCOM, question three would be Metro Rail. Uh, I expect the results would all be within one percentage point of the other questions. So it's not like someone's going to go in there and say, oh, I support moving the police, but I don't think the trains should come to provinces. It's either yes or no across the board. Yeah. And the DA got 63% in the, sorry, they got 59% in the 2014 provincial election. They got 55 in the 
in the most recent provincial election. But if you look at local election results, it's a lot higher. It's four or five percentage points higher. So they're well into the 60s on a local government election. And that's because the ANC gets really bad turnout. I don't know what turnout would be for a referendum, but I expect the DA voters would have very high turnout and the ANC voters would have a local government style turnout. And I think a lot of a lot of ANC voters would actually vote yes, because the people of Kyalicha are sick of the trains and the police not working. Um, you know, uh, they're, they're often uh, the loudest complainants when it comes to Metro Rail and the police. Uh, there was a commission of inquiry into policing in, in Kyalicha, set up by the provincial government under pressure from residents in Kyalicha. So I think the provincial government will will win this referendum, I think, by more than 70%. And if the national government decides they're going to ignore a 70% mandate, well, good luck to them. But, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be a wise idea to ignore that. Mm. Now, how would such a referendum work? It's uh, not as if uh, there are very strict uh, requirements or uh, criteria for being seen as uh, a resident of the Western Cape or of Gauteng or Lesotho or uh, not Lesotho, yeah. uh, Limpopo or whatever. People move around constantly. Um, yeah. Would it be very uh, strict and restricted to only inhabitants of the Western Cape? How would that be controlled realistically? Uh, for example, I mean, it doesn't take a lot to just bus a few ANC voters mm -hmm. from uh, the Eastern Cape if they really wanted to. Um, how would a provincial referendum work? No, it, it would work exactly the same way as a provincial election. So um, if you vote in, uh, so everyone's registered at a particular voting station, right? So I'm registered at a voting station here in Bryanston. Um, and that vote registration is, that, that, that uh, voting station is inside a particular ward, inside a particular municipality, inside a particular mm -hmm. province. So I'm a resident of Gauteng and you are also a resident of Gauteng. And if I move to another part in the, in the country, I'm welcome to re-register with IEC, in which case I'll become a resident of the Western Cape or whatever. Um, but you can only vote in a provincial election if you are inside that province. So I think I was actually registered in the Western Cape and then I came to live in Johannesburg. I didn't re-register. So when I went to the Karting, uh, when I voted in the last election, I think I was only given one ballot because I was in the wrong province. Um, so I didn't get to vote in the Gauteng elections. I got to vote in the national election, which is fine. And it's the same story with people voting abroad. If you're in Trafalgar Square in London, you only get a national ballot. You don't get a provincial ballot because you have to be at your registered voting station. Or, you know, I think there's an exception where if you're not at your registered voting station, but you're still in the same province, they'll give you a provincial ballot. So if you turn up to vote in a provincial referendum in the Western Cape, you will only be given a ballot paper if you're voting, your registered voting station is inside the Western Cape. So you can't bus people in the week before mm. from Port Elizabeth and bus them across the border to Clet and get 100,000 people to vote. What you can do is you can bus them in and get them registered three months before the referendum and then bus them back out and then on election day bus them in. But that's a major schlep. Um, and, and the thing is, South Africa's got great election data. Huh? Like Something like Plettenberg Bay um, the DA came short and played by 14 votes in the last local election. Uh, we've got great data down to the voting district, and any anomalies will show up immediately. I, I don't think that busing people into the Western Cape has ever been an issue, or, or anywhere. I think the last time, the really close province was Gauteng, where the ANC got just over 50%. Um, you know, we've got great data, and we've got great analysts in South Africa as well people who really study that data. And it's it's not easy to rig an election by busing people around. Hmm. So let's say uh, this bid by the DA to get uh, the, to enable these provincial referendums is unsuccessful. What would the next step then be if you are determined to uh, achieve more provincial autonomy? What would the next uh, realistic path be? Um, you go to constitutional court. So. Natasha Mazzoni has introduced this bill. I don't know exactly how parliamentary procedure works, but obviously being the opposition, you don't have control over the House or the legislative agenda. At some point, either the DA or the Western Cape, the Premier of the Western Cape, probably the Premier of the Western Cape, is going to have to go to the Constitutional Court and say, please will you instruct Parliament to enact this law within six months? And I expect that they will win that that case. And I haven't, I haven't seen much movement recently i mean it, it's where we are august 2021 they would want this bill done by the end of next year um 
So I don't know. We have to chat to Natasha Mazzoni, chat to Alan Windy, and figure out where is this bill. And if it doesn't go anywhere, when are you guys going to the Concord? Mm. And uh, you mentioned earlier that the, the DA has refrained from so using even when I mean, we're talking about gaining additional control and powers. But uh, you mentioned earlier that they've refrained from using some of their, their, their control cool. over their, their provincial internal affairs. Uh, yeah. what, what are some of the options that are open that they have not uh, touched or gone near? Sure. So um, before we discuss what they can do, let's just remind ourselves what they can't do. They can't mm. do anything that's going to be very expensive. Okay. Um, they can't roll out big government programs for which require budgets that they don't have. You've got to work within your you got to work within your budget. And they can't raise taxes. Okay. So what are these people going to do? Well, the DA is a liberal government, and the whole point of liberalism, I think, is to try and deregulate the private sector as much as possible. So if you've got too much regulation in a particular area, the province should look at that and say, well, let's pass a provincial law that deregulates it. So for example, the pharmacies, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, industry, they had a major scrap with national government about 20 years ago because national government was trying to regulate the price of, of pharmaceuticals. And I, I came to some kind of settlement. I don't know exactly what it was. It's complicated. There was a case in the Constitutional Court called the Nutrix case or whatever it was. Um, I would look at that. I would say, are the pharmacies overregulated? Can we pass the Western Cape? Pharmaceuticals Act, Western Cape Medicines Act, or whatever. As long as you can get it to fit within the concurrent function of healthcare services, you're good. You've got legislative authority. So you pass your Western Cape Act, you conflict with national, you go to the constitutional court and you get into an argument about is this a matter that can be regulated effectively by the provinces individually? And if it involves cross border commerce, probably not. But pharmacies are very much based within a local community. The pharmacy of Neisner. It's not selling stuff to people in Port Elizabeth. So, you know, I think you've got a shot at that. So t take a look at, at, at the whole function of healthcare services. Um, all of the legislation involving healthcare services is up for, up for provincial legislation. You know, um, the doctors are always unhappy about the, the, the regulation of doctors in South Africa. That's a little bit more difficult because doctors are mobile. You know, you don't, if you're a doctor, you're a doctor. You want to be able to practice anywhere. You don't want to have nine different regulatory schemes telling you whether you're registered to be a doctor. So that's probably a matter that can't be regulated effectively by the provinces individually. So you've got to look at each one on its own merits. But certainly healthcare services, education, can we deregulate the private schools? Um, uh, disaster management, they're about 24 months late on that, but I certainly think there's stuff to be done there. Uh, a big one is consumer protection, okay? So you've got the National Credit Act and the National Consumer Protection Act. Um, you need to look at that and ask yourself whether whether commerce is over-regulated uh, in some respects. Um, what else do we have? We've got agriculture. So uh, speak to the farmers. Are the farmers unhappy about something? Tourism is another big one. People complain about tourism. I would basically track whatever the ANC government does. And whenever the ANC government comes up with a stupid proposal that falls within Schedule 4, I would immediately pass the Western Cape Act that fixes the problem. Um, and I do that across, across the board. Uh, two really interesting concurrent functions are trade and, and industrial, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, trade and industrial promotion. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those are, are really really important uh, and potentially underused. Um, then there's, there's uh, housing as well. Uh, that's my area of research. Uh, I think we've got some really bad housing legislation in South Africa that makes it almost impossible to get anybody evicted. And so what that means is that people stop paying their rent uh, and the private sector stops supplying uh, low cost housing to people, which is why the city center of Cape Town has got sort of luxury apartments, but nothing more than that. People would rather use buildings as parking garages because you make more money out of a parking garage than you do out of out of leasing it out at a, for uh, in a for apartments for a thousand rands a month. And so then you have no, to people, people that uh, have, that you can't evict. You can't exactly. So there's no supply. So you've had a massive constriction of supply, and the government thinks the solution is let's build millions of houses. Well, you're building houses where people don't want to live. They want to live in the city center of Cape Town, but the city center of mm. Cape Town is not providing low-income housing because we've got the National Pie Act, the Prevention of Illegal Eviction Act, and the Rental Housing Act. Really bad pieces of legislation. So I want a Western Cape Promotion of Rental Housing Act that scales back that 
that law makes it easier to get people evicted quickly and efficiently. And then what you do is you couple that up with rental housing vouchers. So you spend your provincial budget on providing vouchers to people so that they can go rent housing anywhere they want in the province. You know, so that, that, that for me is, that, that was my proposal on housing and I would have exactly the same proposal on education. Deregulate education, make it easier to start a private school and then just give, give people school vouchers. I know this stuff is easier said than done, but those are the two big areas that I would look at. Um, and then and then you just got to go through each of these concurrent functions and, and find something. Um, for example, in indigenous law and customary law, that's African customary law. I think that's really important because we've got um, the traditional courts bill that is a draconian piece of medieval legislation that prejudices the rights of women. You've got the Communal Land Rights Act that basically takes land rights away from rural people and gives it to traditional chiefs. You've got the um, Law of Succession Act, which also, you know, it's not great. So the DA can really stand up and fight for the rights of rural black women by passing provincial African customary law legislation that, that preserves the rights of women and children. Hmm. Before we continue, uh, I see uh, Chris Wyatt Africa is in the chat. Uh, good evening, Colonel. I hope you're well. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope you found the, the conversation so far interesting. Um, and then, yeah, so... What I also wanted to know, I mean, we've been talking about uh, South Africa specifically, but it's always nice to have a, a role model or a frame of reference that you can can look to. Do you have any countries that uh, you think in regards to provincial powers and federalism that are the countries to be looking at uh, for that you want to emulate or almost like the gold standard of what you would like to see in South Africa in regards to decentralization of powers in this regard? Yeah, you <laughs> The United States. So, you know, it would be nice if, if the provinces actually ran everything. I, I would love the provinces to be running the police. I mean, you've got to ask yourself, what can the provinces not run? Okay, the defense force. Although you could have nine different defense forces that sort of team up when the national government teams, whatever, you know. Um, I, I struggle to think of a single thing uh, that I would want the national government to run <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, my, my, in my sort of dream world. Um, but I, you know, I think the, the countries to follow would probably be Australia. You know, they've in South Africa, you've got a situation, or I think it's Canada, you, you've got a situation in South Africa where national parliament has control over everything except for 33 functions that are set out where you share it with the provinces, and then there are a couple of jokes which are in exclusive provincial competence some of these other countries they invert that relationship where everything is run by the by the provinces or the states except if it is specifically enumerated and then it's run by the national government so a place like australia or, or canada i think they've got like 20 things that the national government can do everything else is run by the states the provinces mm. um and that would be my way of doing federalism you just turn the whole thing on its head and you make the provinces the center of of the system. But, you know, having said that, I'm not sure if it ever really works out that way because people like to turn to a person who's in a position of authority. So if you look at Australia's response to, to COVID, people turn mm. to Scott Morrison. Uh, in America, they turn to Biden. Um, back in the day, they turned to Obama. When it comes to healthcare, he, he passes Obamacare. The big thing with Obamacare is whether it violated American federalism, right? Because mm. the, the national government can only pass law if it's if it's um fits into the commerce clause of the constitution so the whole civil rights act they could only really get it through if they could argue that it was about interstate commerce um and same with obamacare you know you try to sort of squeeze it into the commerce clause so no matter how well you design your constitution to uh you know I, I i'm a strong supporter of u.s civil rights um and i'm I don't know if I've got an opinion on, on, on Obamacare, but my, my point is simply that people don't try to reform things state by state. They like the federal government to actually do it on a uniform basis. The left always likes to do this. Yeah, like a, almost like a blanket reform. Yeah, you know, so... Um, yeah, I mean, they're always, they're, I mean, so in Australia, the, the states, the individual states, New South Wales and so on, they've got premiers and they've got... Um, ministers of health and so on. Um, 
those guys have been very involved in, in coming up with like COVID rules and, and stuff, but you still find the media turning to Scott Morrison saying, so what are you going to do? And it's quite hard for the president or the prime minister to say, well, actually, this has got nothing to do with me. I'm just the chairman of this country. I'm not actually such an important guy. Uh, I know I'm the president of America, but I'm not actually that important. I'm not actually responsible for this. It belongs to the States. And you don't see many American presidents who take that approach because they're all worried about their, their opinion ratings, you know? So they're, they, they all want to be seen to be doing something. Politicians are always hyperactive, whether it's in America or Germany or wherever. And so they always get involved, you know, and, and it's quite hard to design your constitution. I, I don't know if there are any countries in the world that are really hard federalist countries, maybe the European Union, but increasingly there, the European Union is taking power away from the countries and, and consolidating it in Brussels. Mm. So... South Africa is not, a, not alone in having weak premiers, but they could be a lot stronger than they are. And they could be so specifically if, if the DA won a majority in Gauteng and the Northern Cape, because then you take secession off the table. If, if the premier of Gauteng, he can go ballistic. He can say he wants the police, he wants all sorts of things. Nobody's going to accuse him of being a secessionist. And then the Western Cape can tag along for the riot, you know? And so if Gauteng gets its own police force, well, the Western Cape will get one as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I just feel that it's it's quite late. I mean, in 2021 to start doing this stuff, I would have liked the DA to have won the Western Cape in 1999 and held on to it forever. You know, Helen Zilla Premier in 1999 with a big majority and get rid of the Nats, pretend they didn't exist. Um, and then really push the federal stuff hard in 1999. Here, 2021, we're now starting. It's better late than never. But um, a lot of power has gone to the ANC already and they've already implemented cater deployment across all these all these places you know so the western cape the, the saps in the western cape is very badly run i think and mm. uh if the da ever does get its hands on the saps they're gonna have to fix that thing from top to bottom good luck with that mm. uh, before we continue i see uh, gert janse van rensburg uh, gave 200 rand super chat and he says thanks for a great chat well, Gert, uh, buy a donkey. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm really glad that you're enjoying the chat. I'm also finding it very informative. I think this topic is something, even though, as my guest has mentioned, it's a bit late, uh, better late than ever. I think now uh, people are, are really looking for alternatives. So maybe a final uh, final question here on uh, yeah. regarding the Western Cape uh, before we get into that uh, thread on Aaron's roots. Um, I saw here was a, a comment. Oh, here it is. So Nick Muller said, uh, makes more sense than Cape Exit, uh, talking about federalism. Now, maybe not specifically that sentiment, but I wanted to talk about, there's, a, there's an idea behind uh, finding a solution where people think just uh, seceding the Western Cape and uh, then everything's going to be fine. But I think uh, they, they are missing a key ingredient, and that is first creating the infrastructure of autonomy to use that metaphor uh the state yeah. the, the province first needs to prove that it can effectively run its own police force that it can effectively provide electricity for everyone that it can effectively manage all these powers now, i mean a da voter would tell you of course the da would be able to do that but i mean the proof's going to be in the pudding you're going to have to be able to show that we are able to do x y and z and we're able to do it effectively so I think before the question of a, a referendum on the Western Cape seceding is on the table, I think the building blocks need to be put in place first. Let's start with getting more control over the police. Let's start by getting more control over the energy uh, over yeah. our energy. Let's get start by getting more control over our uh, healthcare, for example. Um, what are your thoughts on on this approach uh, as opposed no. to just uh, drawing that hard border and saying we're a country no. now? You know, build, building the Great Wall of Africa from Plek to Botswana. <laughs> or are you going to take the E as well? I, yeah, um, look, Phil Craig is quite, um, he's quite bullish on this. He, you know, he wants his referendum on, on independence immediately. For, for me, I think it's all about narrative building. Uh, I reckon if you have a referendum on provincial autonomy, on, on all sorts of things, it... And if you win it with a big majority, I mean, that builds your narrative. I mean, the DA has already built the narrative that they govern better than the rest of the country. That narrative has been built because of Zilla's performance as mayor and premier. Um, the ANC has certainly contributed to the narrative that they can't run anything, uh, pervasive corruption, every state-owned enterprise has been collapsed. Um, so I think that narrative's already been built. Now, if you, if you call a referendum, I, I almost feel it's a bit like sort of trying to date a girl, you kind of just need to 
take it easy on the first date you know it, yeah, you don't ask a woman uh, you don't ask a woman to marry you before you know she'll say yes <laughs> exactly because you don't want to lose this referendum either now i think if they yeah. went on independence they might lose it um but if and they, if went they use it that is a that's the that's bigger a bigger loss they're not doing it at all that's that's the stuff up there i mean that that, that would be yeah. pretty humiliating i think if they went because uh, if they made it as unemotional as possible where they said we just want to fix the police because the police is a real stuff up or or escom you know we just, just let us mm. fix escom um and and let us let us deregulate private private um electricity provision if they took that approach um it would take a lot of the sting out of the referendum and that they wouldn't say oh you're trying to be an independent country no we're not trying to be an independent country we're just going to fix fix escom and the police but if you win those referendums with um with 60 70% um it the the narrative is then built um because everyone would have participated they would have gone and voted and then seen the results mm. and it would, you know and and it it really does i think would be the the biggest turning point in south african politics since polokwane since the 1992 referendum since 1948 or whatever it would be mm. massive because everybody in the western cape would get the idea that we're better off running escom police by ourselves okay what else do you want give us sand parks mm. so that we can run table mountain national park uh mm. give us um you know give us the universities so we can run you yeah, give us control over our fishing waters the fishing waters you know give us control of daf uh, the department of agriculture forestry affairs uh, and fishing so that we can run the fishing licenses so then what you do is you start rounding up the fishermen in every little port from cork bay through to armiston and so on saying come guys let's get provincial control of us it becomes a runaway train you know um and um i i just feel they should have done this 10 10 years ago uh they didn't um but Jeez, you know, I want Natasha Mazzoni to put her foot on the accelerator right now and and get that bill through. Stop sort of mm. faffing around with it. It's it, go to the concourse and get this thing to happen, and then call your referendum. Um, because you, you you don't have to call that referendum on independence straight away. Just call your referendum on issues and win your mm. win your thing with six seventy seventy five percent, and then you're in a very strong negotiating position. Huh? and it wins you international credibility as well because the rest of the world is going to look at this and be like you know we we support we support provinces having more autonomy especially when you got a situation where people are shouting one indian one bullet in durban you know and you got sort of kill the boar kill the farmer being shouted by a you know malema and co um if you have a peaceful referendum saying just give us control of the police you know i think you win enormous moral authority and that's what this is about it's about moral authority mm. yeah absolutely uh, i see uh, you're getting a lot of fanfare in the in the chat richard uh, people seem to your ideas uh, your ideas seem to really be uh, be resonating here um but yeah no I, i completely agree and maybe yeah there's a final question there that i wanted to ask as you uh, you reminded me of something now what role can the private sector and community now that you mentioned uh, the unrest and the one indian one bullet that chant what what role can communities and the private sector in the western cape play in not cape independence but rather more provincial autonomy and working yeah, I mean, towards that every everywhere you look national government is taking freedom away from people uh the nhi okay that that's national health scheme that's coming in i don't know how the province fights it from a legislative perspective because if you look at the the overrides you know is this a matter that requires uniformity across the nation and national legislation provides that uniformity you know it's it's a sneaky override because national can effectively abrogate for itself or it's not i don't know if abrogates would that they can effectively say well this particular scheme requires national uniformity therefore we prevail you know so they can sort of rig things in their favor by by coming up with a scheme like that but but i think in every area where national is taking freedom away from people the province should be trying to defend the private sector so defend the pharmaceutical sector the pharmaceutical retail sector defend the private schools if national government starts trying to interfere with private schools um so you know i am making this up but let's say national says um that you have to employ satu teachers in private schools or something just pass provincial law saying that's not going to happen in this province um same with tourism same with welfare services i mean the department of social development came up with a crazy idea that everyone's going to have to pay 12% of their salary to some bizarre fund uh for your pension or something well welfare services is a concurrent function of government so you 
you know, I, I want to see a green paper from the Western Cape Department of Social Development saying that's not going to apply in the Western Cape government. And even if you lose this stuff, because I can see you're probably going to lose that because, again, it requires national uniformity or whatever. Even if you lose it, at least you're fighting and you're generating publicity in favor of your cause. And, you, you know, I, I would use this stuff more as a publicity stunt than anything else. Um, mm. I sense the DA doesn't want to fan the flames of Cape Independence because if every single week you're coming up with some provincial initiative to stop this and stop that and, and we're going to do this this way and we're going to do daylight savings time and, you know, we, we're going to, you know, fiddle with uh, every little thing under the sun just so we can show you that we can, you know, make uh, termination of pregnancy law slightly different or, you know, we, we're going to uh, come up with all sorts of these sort of initiatives. If you do that a lot, you might in you, you might sort of be seen as being sort of uh, the, the DA might attract negative publicity in the, uh, and, and they want to be seen as being a, a party that embraces everybody and as a national party and so on. Mm. And and so I think, I think to a certain extent they don't want to go down that road, but I just feel that, that they need to, you know, not be, not be hostile about it, but I think there are a lot of areas where they really need to push the, push the envelope a lot more. Mm. I uh, see uh, Chris Wyatt has given a super sticker, $5. Thank you very much, Colonel. I greatly appreciate it. And I uh, hope you have a great evening further. And I hope you also hope you're enjoying the chat. Um, Richard, uh, that brings us to the end of that discussion. I wanted to quickly uh, talk about your thread on Adam's roots as well. And I think it relates to what we've been talking to. So you said something. So just for context, uh, when Adam's roots, uh, my colleague at Afri Forum, was uh, visiting uh, the United States on his liaison tour, um, there was a lot of uh, media personalities and journalists attacking him and smearing him as this evil guy. And uh, yeah. you, may, you wrote an incredible thread, actually, and as someone that is not uh, doesn't really know Aaron's that well, you pretty much just unpacked of what was going on here and how you observed the situation. And you mentioned something very interesting there. You said that what we're seeing here is a narrative collapse or we're seeing the collapse of uh, rainbowism. We're seeing the collapse of, oh, the ANC is the, the future of South Africa. They're going to build this United Nation. Um, and we're seeing that narrative quickly collapse. And a lot of people, uh, it's pretty much like a sunk cost situation almost where they've, a lot of journalists and a lot of commentators have, have staked so much of their reputation on polishing the boots of the ANC that now it's almost uh, too difficult and too costly yeah. to to go back on that. So uh, what are your thoughts on exactly what's going on there when you see this backlash towards someone, not even spreading uh, propaganda about South Africa, just someone telling the truth, saying, well, this is going on. Uh, the, here's the picture of South Africa that you're not seeing. Why are we getting this uh, this backlash and this absolute just relentless attack against them? Yeah, no, 100%. And it's... Um it's human nature, you know, people are embarrassed. Something I, I find quite interesting is that somebody once said that for socialists, they, they can't just say that they've lost the argument because it's more than just an argument. You know, there's a lot of ego on the line. Uh, I was at UCT 2007 to 2011. I know, I know that pays pretty well. Um, and I know a lot of the guys who were involved in Roads Must Fall. I know a lot of the academics. And when Roads Must Fall started, those academics all came out in, in favor of it. Max Price and so on, mm. Peter Force and Hugh Corder and the whole UCT Law faculty. And, and, you know, a lot of guys were quite pro it. Roads Must Fall turns out to be a fascist, violent, corrupt mess. Okay. It took a, well, some of us saw that immediately, but it, it took a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and eventually it came out as mm. being clearly that. And what's interesting is UCT never went back on its on its um, initial stance because in order to do that, they would have to say, you know what, we were wrong initially. Mm. We were wrong about Rhodes Must Fall. And the same things happened with the ANC. I mean, lots of guys in 1994, I was one of them. You know, I was very pro-ANC when I was a teenager. Um, <laughs> uh, and when I was in first year university, I was a bit of a lefty. And it was quite humiliating for me to say, you know, I was wrong, you know. And I think part of my sort of political activity since then has been trying to make amends for that because I'm so embarrassed by what, what my initial views were. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of our media figures. These guys, uh, I find that, that there's, a, there's a fairly uh, revolving door between media and politics. A lot of journalists are people who want to be politicians but didn't make it and then 
sometimes politicians leave politics and go, and go into media. They're, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And a lot of these guys were very pro-ANC, right? That's no secret. Uh, we all know who they are uh, in the media. And even, even if they're not pro-ANC, they're very socialist or very African nationalist, and they're very snide towards classical liberals, towards the DA, towards white institutions, you know, and so on. Um, and I see an interesting, interesting comment here. The students happened during the height of state capture, 100%. And many of the student activists were children of the state capture politicians, such as Brian Malefis and Itumaleng Malefe. And, you know, it's, a, uh, it's a funny country we live in. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, nobody wants to come out and say, you know, what South Africa has turned out to actually be exactly what, what many conservatives said it would be. Because to do that would be to sort of be quite humiliating. It would be like saying, I was completely wrong about the ANC. So Ernst Roots goes off to Washington, D.C., and he starts highlighting a side of the country that does not fit the narrative that these guys have been punting of, like a, a rainbow nation where you've got this glorious liberation movement trying to fix the, the sins of, of the past, and you've got this sort of obstinate, still racist minority that's not really contributing mm -hmm. to nation building. That's kind of the narrative they built in the 90s and 2000s. That narrative doesn't work anymore. Uh, racial minorities in South Africa have done everything that's been asked of them. They've contributed enormously uh, to, to many good initiatives in the last 20 years. And the failure of South Africa is not due to racial minorities. It's, it's due, to, due to the ANC and due to very bad politicians and very bad policies that we've got. Um, and there's some horrific things that are happening in South Africa, one of which is Julius Malema calling for ethnic cleansing. You know, kill the boer, kill the farmer is an explicit public instruction to implement mass murder on the basis of race. One Indian, oh, one, one, uh, one Indian, one bullet. Yeah, they just yeah, it's to say. horrifying. Horrifying. And these guys don't want that to be published internationally because it breaks their narrative, um, and it also, um, I think, puts white people, Afrikaners, racial minorities, in the position of a victim. And as we've seen, often victimhood leads to sort of moral legitimacy, uh, and they don't want that. You know, they, they don't want white Afrikaners to, to be placed in a position where they elicit sympathy from around the world. Um, and so they get quite angry, you know. And I think that's what we saw on Twitter when Nick Dawes tweeted about Ernst Roots. I mean, he took a selfie outside the White House. I, I don't know what he's doing there. Nick Dawes doesn't know what he's doing. He went on an interview on Tucker Carlson, okay, to talk mm. about various things. And, you know, I don't, I don't carry a flag for Afri Forum or for Ernst Roots. I've never met the guy. Um, but I'm happy to give him a hearing, you know, I'm happy to have, have him say what he wants to say. I might agree or disagree uh, in the same way that if a bunch of fishermen in uh, Cork Bay want to protest pollution because the pollution is killing their fish, you know, I'm happy to listen to those guys. They might be right, right, right or wrong. And I don't think that, that lefty politicians would sort of come out strongly against a bunch of, a bunch of fishermen in Cork Bay because there's no political agenda there. But with an Afrikaner complaining about farm murders, uh, you know, suddenly suddenly you see a side of, of human nature that's not very attractive. And I think that's what we saw what we saw the other day on Twitter. Yeah, and uh, I do think uh, bringing this back actually to the uh, federalist or more uh, provincial autonomy topic, mm. I do think as that narrative starts collapsing and people see South Africa for what it is rather than yeah. what they want it to be. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a lot more calls for, but I want my province to have more control over our internal affairs. I can see what's going on out there, and I'd rather have that my province can be run by people that uh, have my interests at heart and not just uh, socialist yeah. kleptocrats. So I think as that uh, as that narrative collapses, uh, not only internationally, uh, but more specifically domestically, uh, the calls for more uh, uh, provincial autonomy are just going to grow. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I picked up on this 10 years ago when I did my thesis under Richard Calland at UCT back in 2010. Bumped into Helen Zilla on the side of the road, said, can I send you my thesis? gave me an email address, I sent it to her, next thing I was working in the Western Cape government. And then I sort of stopped going down this road. I ended up, I went to university in the UK for two years, came back, did a stint at a law firm, then I went to an accounting firm, now I'm sort of studying to be a tax consultant, to be a chartered accountant. So, you know, I got out of politics, I got out of public policy because nobody was really interested in, in my ideas, you know, that they, they weren't. Um, and I sometimes feel that I was maybe just 10 years too early on this. Uh, and I felt then, and I still feel now, that um, provincial autonomy is, is the way to go. But in, increasingly, I'm, I'm feeling that 
as South Africa disintegrates, the, the calls for autonomy in the Western Cape are going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, you know, and, and whether people think that's a good or bad thing, um, I think is irrelevant. It's a bit like if you drop an egg off the side of a building, uh, the egg will break. You know, that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just the the unstoppable, inevitable consequence of, of an action. And um, as the police disintegrate or the post office disintegrates or ESCOM disintegrates, you're going to see more and more calls for provincial autonomy. Mm. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something very interesting to behold, specifically that narrative collapse. And I think it's something that's yeah. unstoppable. Um, like I said, it's not like Adam's Roots is going around the world and saying even though that's what the, the people lie about him, say uh, that he's going around saying there's a genocide in South Africa. He's just going around and saying, here's the facts. Here's what's going on. No funny business, no uh, hyperbole. Just we have a immensely corrupt government. Yeah. We have politicians calling for the killing of minorities. Mm -hmm. We have the killing of minorities, yep. um, specifically a, a very specific group of minor or a very specific profession on a scale that's not normal. We yep. have uh, crime levels that are out of control and we have uh, pretty much uh, unrest on a daily basis. These aren't strained. These aren't hyperbole. This isn't a, a narrative that can be easily destroyed. It is just the facts. He's just telling yep. them how it is. And uh, yep. that's the thing. Uh, that's what makes yeah, it uh, so I mean, interesting. I... I, I don't know Afri Forum well, um, but you know, from what I've seen of of Ansuruti, takes an enormous amount of incoming flack from <laughs> every lefty under the sun. Um, but you know, the, the way I, I've seen him deal with it, he seems to be a very well-read guy. He seems to a lot of people at Afri Forum um, and and these various other organisations uh, out there, uh, the Democratic Alliance, Afri Forum. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the others, uh, Alta and so on. These guys tend to be very polite. Uh, very well educated. Uh, again, I have to emphasize my admiration for anyone who's doing this in their second language. So Ernst Roots, you know, is doing this all in English, and he's doing it very well. Um, and and they're just professional guys. You know, they 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 get their facts together, they get their their argument together. I don't think they're pushing a narrative uh, in a way that is uh, unethical or or uh, un not truthful. And so I'm happy to give him. A, a hearing because I mean if somebody else so, starts talking complete garbage well you know then then I lose respect for them but I've never lost res my limited dealings with 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 Ernst Roots you know I, I've been quite impressed with some of the stuff he's produced and so I just mm -hmm. get a little bit agitated when people immediately discount him as being complete nonsense I'm like dude can you not see what happened in Durban a month yeah. ago you know like uh, unfortunately, your narrative, I, I signed up to that narrative in the 1990s and the 2000s. I once tried to join the ANC in 2007, okay? Um, I feel like an idiot for that, but I think sometimes you need to have the humility to say I was wrong. And uh, not enough lefties in South Africa are prepared to do that. They'll, they'll complain about the ANC, but what's interesting is that they can't think outside the, outside the, um, the paradigm of African nationalism. So they're all looking for an opposition party that's like the ANC but not corrupt. And they'll, they'll mm. sort of think of voting for the DA, provided the DA adopt every African nationalist policy, mm. but not be corrupt. Um, and, and the DA sort of went down that road for a while. And then the wheels came off and they've gone back onto being a classically liberal party. But so, you know, the, the, the DA is like a red rag to the bull, but Ernst Ritz is an even bigger red rag to, the, to a bull. <laughs> and what's interesting now is, is because I saw what my response generated quite a big sort of... Um, uh, response on Twitter for what that's worth, I don't know. Uh, I'm sensing a lot of people now can't can't live uh, a lie any longer. You know, I mean, the situation's got so bad, and you've got a guy like Malema who actively promotes ethnic cleansing. You know, people can't um, can't live with that any longer. So. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, Richard, thank you very much. I saw uh, someone in the chat actually uh, summed it up perfectly. So Sideline Opinion says, thank you, Richard and Aaron, for a thought-provoking discussion, which contributes to us finding a solution which will benefit all South Africans. Good work, chaps. So, yeah, I would just like to share that sentiment, uh, Richard. Thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight for this excellent discussion. It was really interesting. Um, just uh, before we get, I'm going to give you an opportunity for some final thoughts just to close off, but I just want to also thank uh, my sponsor, uh, Bidvice, uh, who is a, a 
company that's helping people get into Bitcoin. And that's also a way that you can get individual autonomy uh, over your finances, maybe not on a provincial level, but maybe someday there'll be a Cape coin. Uh, we're just going to have to see. So uh, Bitvice is the only platform in South Africa that allows you to buy Bitcoin and have it sent to your own self-custody by default. This means you're exposed to uh, zero counterparty risk and your Bitcoin is much safer from hacks, confiscation or regulatory capture when you self-custody it yourself. Bitvice offers hands-on guidance for setting up your self-custody solution. They'll help you uh, by holding your hand, setting up your wallet if need be, or point you to the best solutions available on the market today if you would rather do it yourself. If you wish to get your friends and family involved in Bitcoin, Bitvice offers the highest referral fee in South Africa for sending clients their way. So there's a, a link in the description. You can go check it out. And speaking about a, a link in the description, there's also a link in the description to Richard's Twitter if you want to go follow him. And there's also a link to that thread of his that we were talking about. If you want to go read it for yourself, it's uh, it's really a good one. So, uh, Richard, just as uh, an opportunity for some final thoughts, uh, what would you like cool. to to end off with? No, I just want to say you've got got great got great listeners. I really appreciate all your your comments there, guys. I, I've just read through them. Um, you know, really, it's such a privilege to be able to speak uh, in front of this sort of audience. And thanks, Adams, as well for for inviting me on. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of activity in the space, and I'm always very happy to to contribute in any way that that anyone, if anyone ever wants to have a call or wants me to advise on anything, just shout. I'll do it. You know, won't charge or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's it's really a privilege to come on this evening. So thanks very much, guys. Yeah, well, thank you for your valuable time and also for your insights. I think this is a topic where you kind of need someone uh, that's uh, been digging into it to give you a, a simple explanation sometimes because it is a bit daunting. Uh, just the idea of the word federalism uh, scares a lot of people off. So, uh, yeah, and lastly, just uh, thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. Like Richard said, thank you for all your comments and your questions. Uh, really appreciate uh, you also taking time out of your day to listen to things that are important or topics that are important for our future and for finding solutions so enjoy the rest of your weekend i hope you all stay safe and uh also enjoy the the week ahead at work or at school or at university or wherever you are and cheers guys have a good one enjoy your evening god bless <laughs>